I am. I was muted, but I'm ready. Oh, okay, goody. So I think I'll um, I'll say good morning to everybody. Um, thank you so very much for joining us today. Our speaker today is Hal Stern from um, University of California, Irvine, and he's going to talk to us about blood stain uh, pattern analysis. Uh, but before we go there, uh, let me announce uh, the we have two upcoming webinars, one on, at the end of October, October 24. That's going to be an overview of some of the data we have collected at CSAFE and that are uh, publicly available. Um, one is, so part of the webinar is going to be presented by Dr. Yong Wang from Computer and Electrical Engineering at Iowa State. And he's going to talk about uh, a catalog of apps, both for Android and Mac, uh, that he and his students have been working on. And then Susan Vanderplas, uh, from, also from Iowa State, We'll be talking about uh, some of the shoe databases that we have been assembling. And on November 13, uh, we have another webinar, and this is going to be uh, really great. It will be presented by Dr. John Butler from NIST uh, on DNA mixtures. And let me tell you that uh, Dr. Butler is a busy person. And so we were really, really pleased that he found the time to uh, present a webinar for us. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Hal. And um, uh, thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Alicia. Let me pull up my slides. So can every can you see that? And we can hear you too. Perfect. Great, thanks. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to everyone. Uh, this is a project that I started about a year ago uh, on looking at blood stain patterns. I'm not an expert. Uh, I have uh, the work is joint with a couple of students here at UC Irvine. Uh, Tang Zhu, who's a doctoral student, and Tian Yu Pan, who's a master's student. Um, and they've done some really cool stuff that I will show you. Um, throughout, we've been talking with Michael Taylor. Michael Taylor is a former bloodstain pattern analyst, uh, now researcher at ESR, which is the Envir Environmental Science Research Center or something like that in New Zealand. Um, and so he's been super helpful in terms of checking in periodically. And I also want to mention uh, there's a blood stain, there are a couple of other blood stain projects within CSAFE, uh, one at Iowa State, which will feature prominently in some of the things that come. So you'll see some references to uh, Daniel Attinger and Chris Dabrabater at Iowa State, um, and also a group at Carnegie Mellon. So uh, briefly, uh, blood stain pattern analysis is a forensic discipline that looks at crime scenes and the patterns of blood that are left there. Um, the picture on the right is just a small piece of, of an image. Uh, I just, I have that there uh, because the terminology here for me at least is we'll talk about blood stains as kind of the individual droplets and sets of droplets, and then the pattern as the ensemble um, that we work with. So, so that's some of the lingo. Uh, blood stain pattern analysis is carried out at the crime scene, that is they'll do some work there, but then frequently uh, it sketches or uh, picture and pictures of the pattern are brought back and investigated further. Most of the published work on blood stain pattern analysis falls into two categories. One is trying to identify the mechanism that generated the blood stain pattern, and I'll say more about that. Uh, the second is to identify the location within the room of the blood stain letting event. And we are working primarily on number one, uh, but before I dive into our work, I'll show you a teeny bit more about these two uh, questions, the, the, the two objectives. So what do we mean by the generating mechanism of the blood stain pattern? Uh, the, there are a couple of ways that this is done. You can see here a list of primary classifications, passive spatter and transfer, and then secondary classifications. Uh, we're largely focusing on the secondary classification question. That is, can we distinguish an impact event, blood that came because someone was struck in a way, um, and 
blood that came from a cast off, which is if someone was carrying a bloody weapon, it would leave droplets of blood. Uh, I should warn there are, it's not a surprise given the title, but there are pictures of blood stain patterns. So if you're kind of squeamish at the sight of blood, um, this may not be the talk for you. So here are some pictures. Um, this is one that my student kind of put, found and put on the slide. And when I went to look to see who I should credit for this, it turns out it came from a Sporkle quiz. Um, if you don't know the Sporkle site, they have quizzes of all kinds. Um, and so the pictures are on the right and the generating mechanisms are on the left in kind of corresponding geometry here. So a cast off pattern appears at the far right is someone carrying, if you will, a bloody knife or whatever and blood dripping off of it. And then we're gonna focus primarily on impact patterns. And you can see on the first column in the third row down is a medium velocity impact. Um, and then a couple of squares over a high velocity impact. Um, you'll see more of that as we go forward. It's a complicated problem for a variety of reasons. And to be honest, this, what motivated my getting into this was uh, someone connected me with Michael Taylor in New Zealand. Michael is very interested in all the discussions that have been going on about likelihood ratios and wondering if the likelihood ratio framework could be used to think about bloodstain patterns. Because although the previous slide suggested big differences in the kinds of patterns you would see, in fact, sometimes there are not that many stains comprising the pattern and the, stain, the patterns look alike from different mechanisms. And so it's not as easy as it might have looked based on that Sporkle quiz. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of complications. We're only really dealing with the notion that there may be similar patterns. That's our question. Uh, there are questions of the surface, blood on a hard floor and blood on a carpet are, are very different, but we're not gonna talk about that. Uh, the second objective, I only really have two slides on because it's not our focus. Uh, the idea, and there was a picture on the first slide of, from the TV show Dexter, uh, showing Dexter doing this, uh, is to track back from the blood stains what must have been the originating location, either in two dimensions, that is where in the room the person was standing, or in three dimensions if you want to take height into, uh, into account as well. So the existing methods, the way this is most often done is by tracing, using strings to identify for each stain in the pattern, the orientation, and the orientation is a clue from whence it came. And if you trace all the strings back, you might find a common location. So as I say, we're not going to talk about this. We are beginning to think about it. Uh, but the Iowa State group has a very nice paper on this topic that tries to address uh, uncertainty and also the various physical factors that impact blood stains. Um, so the citation is provided here. So now let me get back to what we are going to do and talk about for the remainder of the webinar, which is an attempt to define and automatically extract features from blood stain patterns and then to try and use these features to distinguish patterns produced by different mechanisms. To do this, we need some data. And the data that we're gonna use in the presentation is also from the Iowa State Group. And they've done a real great service to the community in many forensic disciplines, including bloodstain pattern analysis. A real limiting factor in developing methodology is the absence of data. And so they've collected data sets um, and published them in a journal called Data in Brief. Um, and they have uh, so far done two data sets and made them publicly available. Uh, one is impact patterns. Uh, as I described, that's essentially when someone is hit or a bloodletting event happens as a result of an impact. Um, and gunshot patterns. These are also impact patterns, but they are high velocity impact. Um, and uh, as you might suspect, these are not human blood. These are swine blood and generated in a lab. So the impact, just a little bit about the data generation. Uh, the impact data are from two different mechanisms that were set up in the lab at Iowa State. Uh, the one on the right is called, referred to as the cylinder rig. And you can barely see um, but at the bottom of that rod is a, a little pile of blood. And then there's a cylinder that drops down to that blood. And then against the wall is a sheet that captures the pattern. 
The picture on the left is a variation on that in which the blood is sitting on a hockey puck that gets hit by a wooden stick. And they vary some of the characteristics of this. Uh, this is not a slide you're supposed to read, please don't worry. Um, it's just a slide to say that the Attinger group has provided a great deal of detail. So we have the location of the origi originating event um, and a variety of other physical environmental, environmental parameters. Uh, so we don't need much of this, but I just wanted to make people aware of uh, the quality of the data um, and the documentation of the data. So here are a couple of examples of blood stain patterns generated by this impact setup. Uh, one from the hockey puck on the left and one from the cylinder on the right. And so you can see that though both are impact events, they actually have different looks, um, which is part of what complicates the task. Uh, the gunshot data setup is, as you might expect, significantly more complicated uh, and a great deal of care required. So here's a picture from them working in the lab. Again, detailed description of the location of the event and a variety of other information. And here are a couple of examples with uh, different types of bullets, in this case, varying from the left and the right. And you get, again, different images. Um, and you can see that the gunshot and the impact, because they're both impacts, have some characteristics in common. So that's the setup and the orientation, the uh, orientation to the problem. So what are we looking at? Well, we build on an approach that actually came out of Michael Taylor's group in New Zealand uh, in a publication. One publication is this Arthur et al. publication. Uh, they took an approach to this, um, which you can kind of see uh, graphically on the bottom of this slide. At the left is an image of a bloodstain pattern. And Arthur et al. turned it into a binary image. And then they did some morphological operations. And I'll describe these in a little bit more detail. And so those three steps are what Arthur et al. did. And then they focused in on the parts of that image that were ellipses. So like where the cursor is, if you can see that. Um, and then they avoided areas like this where there are multiple ellipses somehow overlapping or large shapes that don't look like an ellipse. So they focused on the ellipses and produced some summary statistics. And when we read that, we wondered if we could maybe get more out of it by including stains like the one that I've circled here um, in blue, that it looks like two or three drops of blood may have fallen on top of each other. And it's not a surprise for the way some of these events are generated that that could happen. And so we thought maybe they could provide additional information. And so where we're headed is the picture on the far right here, which is an attempt to take the image, which is patterns of uh, blood stains and approximate it by a set of ellipses. Interestingly enough, as we got into this, this is actually a problem that has much broader application than blood stain pattern. That is, it comes up in biology uh, where people have images of cells and they wanna separate them or in engineering, people have images of nanoparticles, for example, and they want to separate them. Uh, when we went and got into the literature, that's where a lot of the work had been done on this kind of problem. So I'll talk short, briefly about the first couple of steps, which Arthur et al. did and which we are also doing, um, and then focus in on the segmentation part, which is our contribution. So the binarization is happening because what typically occurs is bloodstain pattern on some kind of background. And the background is not necessarily white. It's often an off-white. And therefore, there's uh, fainter stains in the off-white. You have to draw a boundary between. And so there are a variety of thresholding algorithms for these. Some are listed here. Um, and uh, we used um, this uh, Atsu algorithm that Arthur et al. have been using. Uh, I won't go into the details of that. The second step that I mentioned are the so-called morphological operations. Uh, they are known as, two, or two of the primary operators are erosion and dilation. And the way that erosion works is we have a binary image now. So each pixel is either, uh, I actually forgot how I have it set up. Each pixel is white for the stain and black for the background. 
And the way erosion works is to try and get rid of noise in the image. It takes uh, what they call a structural element in our application, a three by three square of pixels, and you move that around the image. So the three by three square is centered over every pixel. And the erosion step says, keep the center pixel only if the entire square is bloodstained. And so if you take a closer look at the image, you see a lot of very fine lines like tails on some of the stains and small dots that you know maybe don't have enough information for us to work with. So erosion will get rid of those. But it will also shrink the stain, for example, and things like that. And so dilation is, in a sense, the dual operator. Um, it, does the, it works in the exact same way. That is, it takes this three by three square and centers it on each pixel in turn. But it asks the question, is there any image in this three by three square? And so it starts to grow back out the image. But the small things, the tails and the isolated pixels, will not get filled in again. And so by combining an erosion step and a dilution step, you can get a cleaner picture. And the last piece of that is you get a cleaner picture, though it tends to have holes where some erosion happened and didn't get filled in. And so those can be filled. And so here's what this looks like. On the far left is the binary image with all of the tails that I referred to and some of these kind of single pixel or approximately single pixel dots. And the erosion gets rid of quite a bit, you can see. Uh, a lot of small pieces, for example, that were living here in the binary image are now gone. Uh, a lot of these have been shrunk, but they were probably real ellipses over here. So the dilation goes back. The things that were removed over here are still removed, but these ellipses, which had been shrunk by the erosion, are restored to ellipses. And then you can see some of the holes I referred to appearing like here, for example, that we don't actually believe in. So they're filled here. So these are kind of denoising operations. And again, fairly standard in this literature that exists. So the problem that we got more involved in and where Tong in particular did some really fantastic work was trying to take more complex patterns, like the two shown here, and turn them into ellipses. And there are a number of approaches to doing this, so I'm going to walk you through somehow the evolution of this. Uh, not too much detail, but some detail, and apologize if it's not helpful. Um, so to, to, we're starting from the binary image, and the goal is to try and figure out where ellipses may sit. It turns out that a powerful tool in this way is to recode the ellipse in a way that suggests where the centers of these ellipses may be. And so the first algorithm for doing that is known as the Euclidean distance tra transform. And what it, the way that it works is it takes the picture, let's say on the top left, which is a nice elliptical shape, um, and it takes each white pixel in the image, and for that pixel, it computes the di closest distance to the boundary and that becomes the score assigned with that pixel. And so on the edge, you get low scores. In the middle, you get high scores. And those scores then get plotted. So they replace the image of binary image of white and black with a plot of scores. And you can see that the scores in the pixels in the center of the ellipse have the highest scores. They're furthest from the boundary. And those are the places where the center of the ellipse might lie. And then there are, so in the ordinary ellipse, the first two pictures at the top here, that's fairly straightforward, but you can see how it might be helpful in the more complicated pattern on the bottom, which is two ellipses overlapping. And what you get out of the Euclidean distance transform is kind of the spine of the image. So you could, and those are kind of possible locations for ellipse centroids. Um, and then there's some algorithm that has been applied in the past, I'm not going into it here because we don't use it, um, to turn these transformed images into plausible ellipses. In particular, there's something called the watershed algorithm, which kind of imagines filling this with water now and figuring out where ellipses would sit. Uh, there's a, a note in a little bit smaller print here 
Uh, it's not needed for this slide, but it's relevant to the next, which is what the approach I described of computing the distance from pixel to boundary is equivalent in this case to taking each pixel, putting a circle around it of increasing radius um, until it goes outside the boundary. So that's just, for example, a way to operationalize finding this distance. It turns out if you try to use the Euclidean distance transform for our problem, it does not work very well. In particular, it's very, very shape dependent. Um, that is the spine that emerges, and it turns out not to be particularly helpful. So others in the area have worked on something called the elliptical distance transform. And there's a lot of text here, I apologize, but it's the same basic idea. So that is we are taking each pixel in the original binary image and computing a distance, but now the distance has a couple of parameters. So we pick an angle phi and a scaling sigma. And phi and sigma basically define a family of ellipses. And we use those, that family of ellipses to define the distance. So remember I told you the original way we found the distance was equivalent to looking for circles centered at a pixel. Um, the elliptical distance transform takes ellipses with the given angle and scale factor sigma and tries different widths b until the ellipse centered at that pixel goes outside of the image. And so b is the elliptical distance transform. How big an ellipse in this orientation can I fit centered at that pixel? And you get a picture. So we have this two ellipse binary image at the top left. The top right is the Euclidean transform with Euclidean misspelled, I apologize. Um, and then at the bottom left and the bottom right are two versions of this with different angles and different scale factors. So the distance of a pixel from the edge depends on the angle of the ellipse that you're using to measure distance. And so you can see that you get similar pictures to the Euclidean transform, but the points that appear to be centers of ellipses change depending on the angle. And in particular, you can see the bottom left does a nice job of identifying, if you will, the top ellipse, and the angle on the bottom right does a better job of identifying the bottom ellipse. And so by looking at different choices for phi and sigma, you can get a bunch of candidate ellipses. And that's basically the approach we take. But what we discovered when we did this is it's a pretty slow algorithm. Um, the, and the Euclidean is relatively fast. And so Tong, was able to combine the two by going back to the Euclidean transform, so using circles, okay, but changing the image using the ideas of the ellipse. So stretching and scaling the ellipse. And so you can see here the original starting pattern um, and then different scalings and shifts um, on rotating the x-axis and scaling and shrinking things. And so then you just apply the Euclidean transform, which is fast, on all of these, and you get a bunch of, again, candidate ellipses. So I should have said there. Um, so we do this, and I'll say a little bit more later, but we end up with about 5,000 ellipses. That, now, this is an easy picture. Any idiot can see that there's only two ellipses that provide an adequate description here. But in more general cases, we don't know that. So we end up with on the order of 5,000 ellipses that may help explain the data. So the question is, we want parsimonious explanations. How do we get that? And so there are two steps to doing that. The first is to come up with some kind of score for the quality of the fit of the ellipse. But it's not as easy as it may seem. And so here's an approach in the literature which says for each candidate ellipse, and you can see here a different picture and three candidate ellipses labeled A, B, and C. For each pixel on the ellipse, we compute the distance from the ellipse to the closest point on the boundary of the stain. Now the problem we have is if you look at ellipse A, it does a nice job of fitting part of the image. But of course, there are points on that ellipse that are very far from the boundary of the stain because the ellipse will not fit the entire stain, right? So these points over here on A are quite far from the boundary. And so we don't just look at 
all of the scores. To score the ellipse, we take, say, the pth percentile of those distances and use that to score the ellipse, where lower scores, smaller distances, are better fit to the stain. But of course, the best fit, in, as in this picture, A, B, and C, depends on what P you choose. So the picture on the left shows you the score for different values of P. And I think it's a little bit easiest to score, to start from the right-hand side of this picture, which is using the 100th percentile. So it says a good ellipse is one for which the biggest distance that I find is still small. And so in this picture, B does the best job because it gets most of the entire stain. And A and C don't do very well because there are some points on A and C that are nowhere near the boundary. If you move to the left, and in fact, if you go to the very far left, you are looking at, say, the 10th percentile. So you're asking, is there a part of this candidate ellipse that really hugs the boundary? That is, are there, there, if there are 10% really small distances, I'll like that, as C has that characteristic here. Most of C is not near the boundary at all, but the right-hand edge of C, I can never find the cursor when I need it, but um, there it is. The right-hand edge of C is the boundary of this thing. And so C at the far left has the lowest score, and then A has the lowest score for a while, and then B has the lowest score. So the way that we do this in practice is we pick a few percentiles. So now we pick percentiles, say the 30th percentile, and every ellipse, maybe 5,000, has a score. And we then just kind of drop them down in order of score, lowest score, highest score, and so on. And then you'll notice that, oh, you'll have to take my word for it, there are 5,000 ellipses in these pictures. Uh, you can't see 5,000 ellipses. And so the ones that are completely covered by other ellipses become irrelevant. And so we reduce the number of ellipses in this way. And so this picture is actually somewhat representative of what we do. We focus on these three percentiles, and we end up with a smaller set of ellipses. So I mentioned we start with about 5,000. That can really get us down typically to 30 to 50 ellipses, so a significant reduction. And then the last piece is to come up with some optimization. Now, a challenge in all of this work is there's no right answer. That is, there's no gold standard. We don't know how that complicated shape came into being. We're approximating it by assuming it came into being with a certain number of ellipses. But if we allow ourselves a very, very large number of ellipses, we'll match it well. And so the way that we did this was to frame it as an optimization problem. And I won't go through this in great detail, um, but basically we have a small net of a candidate set of ellipses, now on the order of 30 to 50. And then we have all of the pixels on the contour of the stain, that's called X here. And we can compute the distance of each pixel to each ellipse, and then frame this as an optimization problem. We want to choose the set of ellipses so that we minimize the total distance from the ellipses to the stains. So that's this function f of e here on the fifth bullet. It says the target should be to minimize these distances. But our final objective says we'd like to do that, but we don't want to have too many ellipses. And so we set up a criteria that says, let's minimize F plus a penalty for the number of ellipses. So I won't talk too much about that, but there's a parameter lambda here that needs to be set. Um, that is how rigorously do we want to penalize including more ellipses. So here's a summary um, that was a fairly quick pass through uh, how we do this. Um, we use this stretching and Euclidean distance transform approach for a range of angles from five degrees to 180 degree rotations in steps of five and to a range of scaling factors to generate a pool of ellipses. It's in the thousands, as I said. And then we compute scores for all the ellipses. So these scores, remember, are saying, does some part of this ellipse match the boundary of the stain. And we reduce the full set using these scores to those that might plausibly explain the stain, typically on the order of 30 or so. And then we solve the optimization problem, which turns out to be an integer programming problem for which algorithms exist. And this works uh, reasonably quickly. Um, so we're pretty excited about it. So I want to show you a little bit about performance evaluation. 
But performance evaluation is tricky in this setting for the reason that I mentioned earlier. We don't have pictures, real stains, for which we know the correct answer. So I'll show you two things. The first thing is we generated our own simulated images of complicated overlapping ellipses um, and use those to, to, jet, to see how our algorithm performs. And we compared it to two in the literature. Um, I'm not going to describe them in detail. Most everyone is using pieces, something like the pieces we used here. Um, uh, so we, these two are doing things uh, slightly differently. Um, I've given some of their keywords here. Um, but they were two of the best performing that we found in the literature. And we use two measures of performance here. Uh, it may be familiar to some people who work in, in images, but not to all. Before I describe those images, here's an example of what our simulated data looks like. These are four of the simulated images. Uh, you can, each panel of three pictures should be read as follows. The actual true ellipse boundaries are shown in the middle. On the left is the image that was given as input to the algorithms. So that's just a white pixel on and inside the boundary of all the ellipses. And then the right is the result of our algorithm applied to this. And so you can see, obviously, that they're close, um, but they're not exact matches because we're not we're working from the image. And in, for example, the fourth set on the bottom right is very tricky. Um, there's, I think, nine ellipses, but several of them almost overlap completely. And so the true picture in the middle and the picture on the right have general features in common, but don't match perfectly. So here are the two measures, sorry, before the two measures. So what we're going to want to do is compare the second and third image in each of these pictures okay, and see what the, um, how similar they are. And so the Jacquard index is a measure of similarity. High scores are better. And it basically looks at the intersection of the two images divided by the union of the two images. And so numbers closer to 100% are better. The Hausdorff dimension is a dissimilarity measure. So it's looking for distance, for discrepancies. Um, and you have two things that you're comparing. And so you can get the discrepancy either by starting in this picture from the blue and taking on each blue, find the closest point on the green, and then ask what's the worst case for that. Or you can start on the greens and ask for each green point on the surface, what's the closest blue point, and ask in the worst case of that. So the Hausdorff dimension is applied in different ways in different settings. In this case, because we have a true, we did it from the uh, Im from our image to the true, I believe. But so you have the Hausdorff different distance and the Jacquard, and we had pictures like this with different numbers of ellipses. And so that's the way I'll show you the results. Two ellipses, three up to nine, and 200 pictures of each type. And so the performance is shown in these pictures. The picture on the left shows you the Jacquard index. Uh, the, the can be a little hard to read. The vertical axis is going from 0.89 to 0.96. And then the horizontal axis is the number of ellipses, two, three, four, up to nine. Um, there are dots at the average across the 200 cases. And the three colors are um, the algorithm I described is in blue. The green is the 2018 Panagiotakis approach, and the red is the Zafari approach from 2016. And you can see that when there are only two ellipses, um, they all do very well, and at some level ours does the worst on the left, um, but it quickly gets better as the image, our approach gets better as the, we move to more complicated images. And similar results on the right, where now we're looking at the Hausdorff distance, so smaller values are better, and again, once you get to three or more ellipses, this approach works well. Uh, simulations are always not terribly compelling because we built an algorithm to find ellipses and we simulated data with ellipses and we do very well at finding ellipses. So, um, so um, we looked for another way to try and validate some of what we were doing and in conversations with Michael Taylor, um, he mentioned that 
one of the things they do when they test blood stain analysts um, for proficiency um, is they have they show them stains, typically single stains rather than the pattern, a single stain, and ask them to measure the orientation, the angle, and the size of the ellipse, things like that. So we're going to use some data from that. Um, so it's not exactly the task we were looking at. We're going to apply our algorithm basically just to single ellipses. But as I'll show you in a second, single ellipses don't look like single ellipses when you get blood stains. Um, and, so, and show you some data from that. So these are the stains on the left that were provided as part of the proficiency exam to blood stain analysts who are asked to give measurements of the size of the ellipse and the angle of orientation of the ellipse. Um, the picture is not very easy to see, um, but so what we did is just applied the algorithm that we developed to these patterns, and they typically get approximated just by a single ellipse, but the question that arises is how much of the tail do you count in the ellipse, for example, and the like. Um, so we applied our algorithm to this, sent our results to Michael, who has this data from the proficiency test. Um, and so the comparison that Michael did that I'll show you in a second is to see how our measurement of the uh, angle compared to what examiners did and also uh, another algorithm that they, kind of, that they developed in New Zealand. So here's the result of those manual comparisons, uh, comparison with manual measurements. So let me tell you what you are seeing here. Um, on the horizontal axis is the angle that the true, if you will, angle that was used to generate the blood stain by the organization that set up the proficiency test. And then the vertical axis is uh, the fitted angle by either the examiner or the algorithm. And what's shown here are two horizontal bars. If we look at the set of data near 57 degrees or so over here, the horizontal bars at the top and the bottom here show the range of results from a set of 10 examiners. So that was the angle they identified. And then there are three summaries here, or three dots. They overlap a fair bit, so it's hard to see them all. Um, there is a purple dot, which is the mean of the examiners. Not super easy to see. Uh, there's one about 28 degrees or so where you can kind of clearly see the purple dot as is the top dot. And then there are two algorithms, an algorithm called Python, which is in orange, and our algorithm, which is in green. Um, so these are estimates derived from ellipse fitting algorithms, if you will. Um, and you can see, again, this doesn't really prove very much, um, but the algorithms are comparable and arguably uh, um, Sorry, and the 45 degree line here is, of course, uh, getting exactly the right answer. So generally speaking, the algorithms do well. Um, this is not the task our algorithm is really set to do, um, but it does reasonably well and is comparable to the existing algorithm Python and looks a lot like the right answer as the mean of the, of the examiners and the 45 degree line. So again, Hard to do a very convincing evaluation, but we're reasonably content with the way our algorithm seems to be working. And so having developed this algorithm, I want to return to the objective that I set out at the start of the talk, which is, could we use this way of looking at bloodstain pattern images to help identify the mechanism that generated an image? So I guess about a couple of years ago, I gave a talk about likelihood ratios in the same webinar series. Um, but to remind you, uh, the likelihood ratio has been re receiving a great deal of attention in discussions about the analysis of forensic evidence. Um, it is framed in the following way. Suppose we have two competing hypotheses about the way the evidence came to be. In many of the CSAFE talks that you've heard, we're thinking about uh, blood, uh, about fingerprints or bullets and asking about the two hypotheses that either the two pieces of evidence from the crime scene and the suspect came from the same source or a different source. Our problem differs from that. 
Uh, there are two hypotheses, maybe that in our case, it's an impact generated blood stain or a bullet generated blood stain. And we'd like to ask, use a likely ratio to decide how likely the evidence is and whether the evidence supports one of those hypotheses more than another. So the likely ratio framed in this way says, what's the probability of getting the evidence, this image, if the data were generated by hypothesis one, say impact, divided by the probability of seeing the evidence, again, this image, if the data were generated by hypothesis two, the gunshot. So we're gonna apply that here. Obviously, it's challenging to figure out how to define the probability of seeing the image. So we will summarize the image by some features and use the probability of those features. That approach is sometimes known as being a score-based likelihood ratio. Um, it can be thought of that way or as a reduction of the evidence to these features instead of the entire image. So we have some desiderata for the features. Um, they should be unitless, that is just they shouldn't depend on scale and the like. And to the degree we can construct them invariant to rotation, shifting, and stretching. So that is if someone changes the, or changes the orientation of the image, that shouldn't change the features. And we will show you several different kinds of features derived from the images, taking advantage of spatial information, that is where are the ellipses in these various patterns, and directional information, that is how are the ellipses oriented, thinking that these are likely to provide information that may distinguish between different mechanisms. So here's an example of what we mean by this. Um, you have a picture on the right of a blood stain pattern, a large number of stains or drops here. And remember, what comes out of our work is that image on the right is now approximated by a set of ellipses. Okay? And the total set of ellipses could be reasonably large. Let me remind you, I walked through an algorithm that was working every, a single stain at a time. And for that stain, we ended up with somewhere between zero and 30 ellipses. But there are a large number of stains in this pattern, like hundreds and sometimes more. Um, so each stain is approximated by ellipses. Each ellipse gives us features. And those features, um, it, each ellipse has a location and a size, and we have features that we've defined. So what kind of features did we define? Um, one way to define a feature is to look at the locations, spatially locations, of all of the ellipses. So this takes the xy coordinates of each ellipse, and we just borrowed this from uh, the Arthur et al. publication. It fits a uh, polynomial regression to the centers of all the ellipses and looks at how well that does as a regression. Um, in particular, that might pick out things like cast off. It turns out not to be super helpful in the problem we've given ourselves. Uh, it was in the literature, so we wanted to start there. Um, and then the second thing we did was we took uh, a principal component analysis of all of those pairs, XY centroid locations. And so you get basically two eigenvalues out of that that get you a summary of the orientation of all of these locations. So I have several summaries of the data here. On the left are the 59 impact images that we worked with and the 39 gunshot images. For each image, we compute those two summaries. The vertical axis is the R squared, if you will, for that regression. And the horizontal axis is the ratio of these two eigenvalues. And in this case, you can see the red and blue dots overlap. The pictures on the right show the two measures separately, asking if you look just at them. So the top picture shows the coefficient of determination. And so there does seem to be a difference. That is, the gunshot patterns are more consistent with a third degree polynomial, if you will, running through the centers than the impact patterns, but there's a very high degree of overlap. So again, those who've been participating in other CSAFE webinars 
when you have a one number score, you often get pictures like this um, overlap. And the second measure, the ratio of the eigenvalues, um, is even a little bit worse. That is, there's not much difference between them unless you end up with a very small ratio of the eigenvalues. So the spatial information in this setting turns out not to be very helpful. Uh, I'll note that if we think about the various kinds of patterns of images that I showed you at the beginning with my little sporkle quiz picture, um, there are clearly some of those for which this will be, this kind of information will be helpful. But it turns out not to be so helpful here. So instead, we began to focus on directional information. So focusing on the angles. And so you saw a picture like this earlier, but I didn't talk about it then. So let me talk a little bit more about it now. Uh, the picture on the left shows a little bead of blood as it falls to the ground and leaves an elliptical shape on the ground. And that ellipse, the angles and orientation of that ellipse provide information about the source of that stain. So the string method that I showed you at the very beginning um, works off of this same principle. That is, we find that angle phi, which looks at the orientation of the ellipse relative to the x-axis in this case. And that tells you the angle, the direction from which this stain came. The angle theta is the angle relative to the vertical. And so we can, from each stain, kind of get this representation in terms of these two angles. And the picture on the right kind of shows a visualization, if you will, of the stain thinking uh, with the distance r kind of, we don't have r, we just have the ellipses, so we get the angles, but r kind of showing you the distance. And I'll come back to that in a second. So working with directions in statistics can be a little tricky. Again, there are other examples beyond blood stain, but we have these angles, in particular phi, which is the orientation of the ellipse, the blood stain, um, runs from zero to 180. And traditional statistics don't work very well. The famous example when you're working with angles that I wrote here is you know, if you ask students, what's the average of two degrees and 358 degrees, and you think of ordinary statistics, you say, oh, I'll just average the numbers. That's obviously not quite right for angles. And so there are texts on directional statistics. I'll show you one in a second. But one of the basic ideas when working with directional statistics is you can't think about the numbers. And so is to think about the angles as in terms of the information they convey. And in this case, if you take two and 358 degrees and think of them as points on the unit circle and work on those points on the unit circle, you'll get the right idea, which is that the distance between the two is very small, that it, they average around zero. And in fact, there's very little variance where two and 358 would tell you the mean is 180 with high variance. Um, so we'll do this uh, twice. Um, so I mentioned the book. Again, this is not a slide you're supposed to read. It's a slide that reminds me to tell you about the source for what we've done. So the book by Marty and Jupe called Directional Statistics, in which they talk about how to turn uh, sets of angles into means and variances. And so we applied that here to both of the angles, phi and theta. And you have a picture here on the left um, that shows you not the means, but the variance of the angles turns out to be informative. So th this is, remember phi is the orientation of the ellipses, and the gunshots are producing a wide spatter with bloodshot, with stains pointing in every direction. And so high variance in phi and the impact similarly, but less high. Mm -hmm. And the variance of theta is the orientation relative to vertical. Uh, there's a little bit more overlap there, but again, some difference. And again, on the right, you can see how we might use this. So the variance of phi gets applied to each image and seems to do a reasonably good job of distinguishing the gunshots from the impact patterns. Uh, last feature or feature set I want to mention is looking at, so that was looking at the two angles separately. We can also look at the covariance of the two angles um, 
So that's a little bit more complicated. If we're looking at two angles at the same time and want to get information about their covariance, we need to think of them as points on a sphere. So the same way single angles were represented on the circle, two angles identify a location on the sphere. And we can look at those locations and basically do an eigen analysis to determine what the primary orientation of those are and how spread out those are. Unfortunately, we have a little bit of confusion in creating my pictures. The information from this spatial textbook, T1 is the largest eigenvalue, T2 is the second, and T3 is the third. And of course, my picture has that reversed. So T3 is the largest. So we um, are looking at the middle picture, the top picture here is the way that our data ends up looking. And I'll show you the measures we get. You can look at the covariance, you look at lambda one and lambda two, which are the two eigenvalues, which provide information about the spread of these points. Um, turns out, in this case, some value, not super value. So let me try and summarize, so there's time for questions. Um, I talked about the likelihood ratio, but I never quite showed you likelihood ratio, so let me do that. Uh, I'll just focus the picture on the left, since that's the one we kind of saw the best results on. So what you see here is, if you take the picture on the left, the column that's labeled gunshot is computing the likelihood ratio, the probability of seeing these features, the variance of phi, if it's an impact pattern, divided by the probability of seeing these features, this variance of phi, if it's a gunshot pattern, we would expect low likelihood ratios, and we do. In fact, only one or two of the 40 images have likelihood ratios bigger than one. These are the logs of the likelihood ratios. So the variance of phi does a nice job of distinguishing gunshots from impact, um, but the true impact patterns don't work quite as well. There's a fair bit of confusion for some of the impact patterns. So that's how the likelihood ratio might work. We also looked at these as classifiers. We changed it into a classification problem. I usually argue against this. I don't think it's the right way to think about the problem. Um, but if you do that, you do see here that the spatial information that we started with is not very helpful in this case. But the directional information is. So let me summarize, basically, what you heard. Um, we've developed a method to identify features based on an ellipse representation of a blood stain pattern image. Uh, the performance evaluation that we were able to do was to do a simulation study where the algorithm works quite well, and it also seems comparable to what other people are doing in the task of identifying angles. And then I closed the webinar by showing you how this pushes us in the direction of doing the blood stain pattern analysis. Uh, I should mention several of the limitations, one of which is this is really a proof of concept type project. Um, to, uh, to have this be useful in practice, one would need to have a range of images representative of casework. So it's very much a proof of concept. Uh, the second, the future work, the work that's ongoing, is to get data from other mechanisms. Um, ideally, so that we can see how well this works more broadly. Um, but in particular, one thing that showed up, which I hid from you, is uh, there are patterns and specific stains for which the ellipse-based approach does not work well. Um, and we found that in some of the gunshots batter, where there's, you can imagine, hundreds or thousands of drops of blood on top of each other. Um, it just looks like a big blob. And you, you, know, you end up approximated by a single ellipse or so, which is not representative necessarily of what we think happened. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, so I will stop there. Um, we have, should have a few minutes for questions. Oops. And I'm going to go back to the Zoom call. Whoa. So I want to open up the chat box, OK? Any questions? Okay, there's a question here locally, which I don't know that people could hear, so I'll repeat it. Um, I showed a picture of uh, the performance of our measure of our approach versus others, and we looked at for a different number of ellipses, and we actually simulated. 200 
pictures of each kind. And that's the average of the 200. Um, it's a little trickier than it sounds because when you start with a certain number of ellipses um, and then generate the images uh, and randomly generate them, some of them can kind of lie within others. So we kind of would simulate and check to see whether that happened or not. And then, uh, so, but we ended up with 200 of each. No questions. Hold on, there's a question here, Hal. Um, yeah. Nice work, Hal. This is Daniel from CSA. I, I was wondering, um, I'm happy you used the, the two data sets that we uh, produced uh, here and also with, with the help of uh, NIJ. Uh, it looks to me that you have used all the beating, um, all the impact spiders, patterns that we produced, but only two thirds of the gunshot spider patterns. So, because we had uh, more than 60 gunshot uh, spider patterns and, and the number you gave, I think was 40 or 37, I don't remember. Uh, do you know why some of the gunshot spider patterns were excluded? Yes, um, so we used 39. Um, I didn't have the full number, I apologize for not representing it correctly. Um, my student made up that slide and, and didn't tell me that. But I do know why we didn't use them all. And it's the last issue I mentioned, which is some of the gunshot blood stains are definitely not well suited for our algorithm in the sense that there's one very large stain. And so the choice was, uh, or not just one very large stain, but one very large stain that dominates the pattern. And um, we could have ignored it and used just the smaller stains that surrounded it, but we decided not to use them. Uh, to be completely honest, all of that happened in the last week or so. So, so that's then, the explanation. Yeah, maybe you want to define a feature that if they have a big round stain and a bullet hole at the center, it's likely a gunshot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea. Uh, other ideas. Um, there's a. There's a question, and again, thank you for the data, Danielle. It's uh, super, super helpful, as I said. Uh, there's a question from Karen uh, Kafedar. She says, how much is the likelihood ratio affected by the approximations to the densities? Uh, really good question. Um, this relates closely to the work that uh, Lund and Iyer uh, published in the NIST journal and with respect to glass data, and that we had a webinar about I guess maybe a year ago or so, uh, the, we've generated likelihood ratios in this case by taking, for example, the distribution of the variance of the phi angles across the relatively small number of images, 60 and 40, and creating a density. And so Karen's asking, there are a lot of ways to do that. Most of those algorithms have themselves a parameter that determine how smooth or bumpy that approximation is. So uh, as I said in the answer to the last question, uh, most of this is happening in not quite real time, but close to real time uh, in the last week or so. Um, and um, uh, we only have the one, so I don't know how robust. I expect that most of what um, Steve and Hari mentioned is relevant here too. Uh, there'd be some variation and that'd be a good thing for us to explore. If, another question locally. Oh, it was more related to the uh, the definition. Uh, there was some primary mechanism in the second theory, but they have the same thing for the question. So why? Um, I don't remember all of the terminology. Um, there's a rich terminology, and uh, there's a uh, thing many people know, but not necessarily everyone. There's a group called the OSAC, the Organization of Scientific Area Committee. So they have a bloodstain pattern analysis group uh, that sets up standards and the like. So they have a lot of uh, terminology that's traditional um, into kind of broad categories of how the stain was generated in terms of uh, directly from the event or a transfer from one person or object to another or a drop or dripping. And, um, and then some of the secondary classifications use terms that might appear in more than one of the primary classifications, I think is what you saw. Um, and uh, I think that's true, but I can't say too much more about that. Yeah, and Bill. 
Um, I wonder if you could talk generally about how you see the steps that would be needed to take to go from where you are now to a useful forensic science tool that can be used by practitioners. Um, you mentioned that I'm not, it seems obviously you need a large number of known source states where the mechanism is known and you have uh, under different circumstances so you can see the range of variation that occurs in, in, yeah. in the wild uh, among four states of different types in, in order to try to see how discriminating it is for various purposes. So what, I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit more about Sure. Um, let me repeat the question. So Bill Thompson, sitting here in Irvine, asked about uh, what the steps might be that take us from the last few slides, which are a proof of concept, to actually using something like this in practice. Um, and in asking the question, he answered uh, a fair part of it, which is one needs to be able to be confident that this, the, it's, it's a great question and it's, Short answer is probably tricky. You want to be able to have distributions that are representative of the stain generating mechanism. So what are the range of patterns that one might see from a gunshot impact or from another impact? And we have um, the data that Danielle created um, with his collaborators. Michael Taylor in New Zealand does some of this as well. He has interns come into his lab and generate patterns. And they're frequently done under varying experimental conditions. That is how much blood was used to create the impact. Um, and as Daniel did, varying the magnitude of the impact and the like. And so one of the things that we're hoping to do is to try and figure out whether there are features that are less impacted by these various characteristics in the hope that they may be generally representative. But because otherwise, I don't really know how to do it to get a representative set. Uh, there's a good analogy here with some of the work that Henry Swafford has done with FR stats, for people familiar with that. So they've developed a way of generating a score-based likelihood ratio. Um, there's some question about whether it should be called a score-based likelihood ratio, but for today I will call it that, um, which is looking at the probability of seeing a uh, tail probability under a null hypothesis, under a same source hypothesis, and a tail probability under different source hypothesis. Um, and the question is always under the different source hypothesis, you know, what features are you holding constant right, in the different source? Um, what is the range of the different source? And so he found, uh, not surprisingly, um, he knew that it was very important to fix the number of minutiae. And so he looks at scores generated by non-matching pairs that have the same number of minutia and compares that to same source with the same number of minutia. So we don't know what those characteristics are in blood stain that we ought to be saying, is one reference distribution for impact the right answer? Or do we need several different reference distributions for impact depending on the um, substrate? carpet versus floor, yeah. depending on the height from which the thing happened. Or, so we're explore, we hope to explore some of the data that Michael's been generating uh, to say, are there features that seem less affected by a volume of blood, magnitude of force, um, substrate, distance to the source, those kinds of things. So that, that would be a way to kind of begin to think about it. But it, it's a real challenge to make that translation. Um, there was. Hal? Yes. Uh, this is Jay um, from Carnegie Mellon. Um, I'm wondering whether um, people who analyze um, blood spatter really have trouble distinguishing gunshots from uh, impacts. That is, uh, I'd sort of look for holes in the wall. Um, uh, so so I'm, I'm wondering whether this is really something that they need to do. So uh, obviously a hole in the wall is very helpful. Um, and, but the question is, what if there's not one? Um, and uh, yes, so they do this. I mean, this is their job. They do this. Um, there are a variety of impacts. Um, if you ask, um, do they have trouble? Uh, you know, it depends who you ask. Um, so I'm not sure that they think there's trouble. I think they're, you know, and I've been through a couple of presentations and, and caseworks. Um, but Bill Thompson here has done some work that he's reported to our group. Uh, in concert with blood stain pattern researchers, where again, contextual information can have a big impact on what people find. That is, if they know that the neighborhood has big sound, yeah. 
it looks like a gunshot. And if they heard fighting and thuns, they think it looks like an impact, you know, a blunt object impact. So um, it's a great question. Um, and, but I'm told, I rely on people who know more than I, both Michael Taylor and uh, Bill Thompson, um, that there's value in doing this. Um, I'll answer with one more point, which is bloodstain pattern has been the subject of some discussion recently. So the Texas Forensic Science Commission, which at a state level reviews the status of variance disciplines, um, had some hearings on bloodstain pattern, I think about a year ago uh, or so. And where they ended up was kind of neither here nor there. That is, they expressed some skepticism and in particular wanted to see uh, more of an effort to accrediting bloodstain pattern analysts so that just anyone couldn't declare themselves an analyst um, because you can take a course for 40 hours and get the basics um, but there's some concern about whether those people are as reliable as people um, who spent more time and seen more cases. Um, so uh, the short answer to your question today is like some of the other disciplines uh, there are questions about how well this is done in practice and the uh, proof of concept here was partly oriented at that, which is it'd be interesting to see what these kinds of methods do and then see um, how they compare to uh, other approaches. Uh, last comment Last comment on reply to that was uh, the folks at the FBI and Nobles, I believe, are just beginning a black box study of bloodstain pattern analysts. Um, so they were asking for people to volunteer to participate in such a study and getting feedback at the recent IAI meeting on their study design. So great question. So um, we're a little bit over, so I think we should probably stop. Um, I thank you um, all for the questions. Uh, that was super helpful. Thank you, Al, and thank you everybody for listening. See you on the 24th.